as well. Well, thanks, Dan, and thanks to all of you for coming back. Like you said on a Saturday morning, a lot of you probably could be doing a lot of other things, sleeping in or uh, watching TV or just getting some house things done. So I really am always humbled when I come and do things on a Friday night or a Saturday morning. Uh, I realize it's really a sacrifice of your time to come and to spend talking about an important topic. So thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, like Dan said, today, in today's three sessions, we're going to be shifting gears just a little bit to talk and focus a little bit more on sexual identity. And in our first session, we're going to try and lay out a biblical framework for sexuality in general. And in a lot of ways, it's normally the session that we would have even done before we did last night. And so it seems maybe a little bit out of order. But this morning's session, I think, will really help orient all of us and give us a broad framework for what Scripture has to say, uh, both about gender and about sexual identity. And one of the benefits, too, like we talked about last night, as it relates to our kids and as it relates to teens and adolescents, is all of us, especially parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, teachers, we have to be equipped to be able to tell a better and a more compelling story about sex and gender if we're going to be able to combat what culture uh, promotes. And so that's our goal today in this first session is to lay out a biblical and a theological framework for sexuality. In our second session, we'll kind of do what we did last night and we'll kind of tackle sexual identity in general, talk about lesbian, gay, bisexual, uh, how do people form those attractions, what does it look like, what are some ways that we can uh, understand each of the different levels of sexual identity. And then in the third session, it'll kind of mirror last night's last session where we'll talk about how do we build relationships uh, for the gospel. So let's talk about sexual identity in this framework uh, for human sexuality as the Bible talks about it. Uh, one of the tragic consequences I think we identified last night in terms of where culture is at as it relates to sex and gender is that we're told uh, the, the narrative that's communicated is you should really just do whatever you want. Do whatever makes you happy. Whatever you feel is what you are. If you have these feelings, then that must confirm that you are whatever those feelings are. And we're told to, to just do you, to go find yourself, etc. All of which is incredibly true as it relates to sex and as it relates to sexual identity. And the problem that we identified last night is this, not only with gender, but also with sexual identity, is that if sex and gender is whatever you want it to be, then ultimately sex and gender are meaningless, right? It can't be anything and be something at the same time, right? If, if, if all of us in this room have a completely different definition for what sex and gender is, then at the end of the day, there's really no meaning to it, right? If we all get to self-determine what sex and gender are. And in fact, this is exactly where culture is in terms of sex and gender being somewhat meaningless. Uh, recently, Alex Morris did an interview in Rolling Stone magazine with a well-known uh, rock star. And the rock star was being interviewed by Morris and talking about sex and talking about the hookup culture in that culture. And listen to what he said talking to Alex Morris, the interviewer at Rolling Stone. He says, it's so much more fun to get sex out of the way and see how you can connect and then focus on who they are as a human being. Are you interesting? Are you fun to be around? Great. Sex isn't inherently a huge step. At the end of the day, it's just a piece of body touching another piece of body, just as existentially meaningless as kissing. Right? What's, he, what's he saying there? What's he identifying there? He's saying, listen, at the end of the day, what I do with my body is really not that big of a deal. Who I have sex with at the end of the day is not that big of a deal. It is existentially meaningless. And in many ways, he's kind of tipping his hand and showing his cards as to what I think culture is trying to do with sex and gender is that if it can be anything that you want, at the end of the day, it's nothing. It's meaningless. And Morris identifies that problem, which shows why Christians in the church in particular and why your church needs to have a more compelling story about human sexuality. I'll talk about another one of my favorite Disney movies, Little Mermaid. You guys know I have four daughters, so we watch a lot of Disney movies at my house. You guys all probably remember, right, in Little Mermaid that Ariel, she, she's collected all of these forks down in her cave of wonders. And she goes and she talks to the seagull and she asks the seagull, she goes, hey, what, what, what are these? And the, the seagull somewhat authoritatively says, oh, I know exactly what those are. Those are called dingle hoppers. And human beings use them to brush their hair. And, you know, Ariel gets really excited about that. And she says, oh, that, you know, that's terrific. Well, we all know how the story goes. She grows legs. She's at the first dinner with Prince Eric. And she sees the forks laid out at the table. And she picks up one of the forks. And she starts to do what? 
she starts to brush her hair with it. And everybody else at the table is kind of looking at her a little bit inquisitively because they all realize that what she's doing with the fork is not what the fork was what? It's not what the fork was made for, right? Can the fork be used to brush a person's hair? I don't, I mean, the women out here might be able to help shed some light on that. I, I guess it can work that way. But I guarantee you that whoever created and designed the fork did not design and create it to be a hairbrush. And so if we want to understand sex, and if we want to understand God's design for it, we have, to talk to, we have to talk to him. We actually have to go and see what his design is for it. You might have your own decision or have your own ideas about what sex and gender are for, and that might work for you. It might make you personally happy. But if that's not what God designed it for, you're not using sex and gender in the way that he intended. And so that's what our goal is then, is to try to, from the very beginning, talk about sex and gender as God designed it so that we're not at a table and seeing a bunch of forks and brushing our hair with it, but that we're using the forks to actually eat food, which is what it was designed for. So if you have your Bibles, let me invite you to turn with me to Genesis 1. In today's session, in this morning, we're going to be doing a lot more work from Scripture and so we'll be grounding all of our talk today really from Genesis all the way back through to Revelation. In Genesis 1, a really familiar passage, we talked about it just even briefly last night. It says, God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image and the image of God he created him Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And from those original verses there in Genesis, we begin to see a theology of who God is and why he made us begin to develop. And we see in the first verses there that we have a creator. And I'll I'll give you some words then to attach to each one of these points that helps us even further understand it. Because we are, uh, because we have a creator, we are dependent beings. We are dependent beings. We're not created independent, right? We actually have a ruler. We have somebody who made us and designed us. Not only do we have a creator, but we are a created being. We didn't just come here by chance. A blob of, of mass of, of neurons and chromosomes didn't just ooze out, and then suddenly we kind of just popped out here at the end. No, we were actually designed and created. And the word that you can attach with this is that we're valuable. We have dignity. Because we are made in God's image, not only are we dependent, but we are valuable. We have human dignity and worth. And not only are we created, but we see in Genesis 127 that we are engendered beings, right? We see from the very beginning, guys, that gender is not a product of the fall. It's not that gender was something that that God just cooked up later on afterwards because there were some mistakes that he needed to correct. No, gender, creating people male and female, was actually a part of his design. I think sometimes we forget that that complementarity between male and female would not have been a surprise to the original readers there in Genesis 1. And in fact, the entire movement of creation has been to create complementary pairs, right? That you see in the very beginning in Genesis 1 that God is creating light and he's creating dark. He's creating evening and he's creating morning. He's creating the waters above and the waters below. He's separating the land animals from the sea animals. N.T. Wright says this. He says that the binaries in Genesis are so important. It's all about God making complementary pairs which are meant to work together. The last scene in the Bible is the new heaven and the new earth, and the symbol for that is the marriage of Christ and his church. It's not just one or two verses here and there which say this or that. It's an entire narrative which works with this complementarity so that a male plus female marriage is a signpost or a signal about the goodness of the original creation and God's intention for the eventual new heavens and new earth. Right? Do, you, do you see what Wright is saying there? He's saying, listen, male and female is not just this random thing of God wanted to create two different kinds of people, but that there's something about God creating difference. There's something about God creating complementarity between two things that's actually a signpost to his actual design. St. Andreatus writes, he says, the Bible sees gender then as a further gift added upon our biology, shaping our identities in deeply revealing of God's self. And again, this is one of those teaching points for parents and for youth workers, etc. out there, is do we talk about gender then as a good thing? Do we actually see gender as a good gift 
that God has given to us to actually help express God's created design. So not only do we have a creator, not only are we a created being, an engendered being, but we are sexual beings. That's clear from Genesis 128. And we talked about this again last night, that the first commandment in Scripture is not a prohibition, but it's a what? It's an invitation. That the very first command that you and I get from God Himself is not, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't touch this. It is an invitation. It is be fruitful and multiply. Nancy Piercy writes, she says, if we are ever tempted to think that sex is corrupt or dirty, we need to remind ourselves that it was God who created it in the first place. Sex is not something introduced after the fall. God pronounced sex very good. And we talked last night, we referenced Howard Hendricks' line where he says, we should never be ashamed to discuss what God was not ashamed to create. We should never be ashamed to discuss what God was not ashamed to create. And I think a lot of times the church has missed the boat on this. And we don't talk about sex. We don't talk about gender because we think in some ways that it's corrupt or that it's dirty. Not only about sex in general, but also about our bodies. Uh, Lauren Winter writes, she says, we Christians get embarrassed about our bodies. We're not sure whether bodies are good or bad. And therefore, it follows that we're not sure whether sex is good or bad. One of the very first things that we see in Genesis is that we are created as embodied beings. We're created both body and soul. That there's this beauty in Genesis 2 where a man and a woman are standing in front of each other completely naked and we're told that they are naked and unashamed. That there's no sense of shame, there's no sense of impurity, there's no sense of awkwardness between two individuals that God created because there's a complete wholeness and congruence with one's body and with one's gender. There's no gender dysphoria is another way that we might say it, right? There's no sense where Eve is thinking to herself, well, maybe I'm not really a woman. And there's no sense from Adam of maybe I'm not really a male, right? But that what God gave to us in gender is the way that he designed and created us to be. That's why Tim Keller writes, he says, biblical Christianity then may be the most body positive religion in the world. Right? When we think about Christianity, we should be talking about the body. We have been inattentive to the body, I think, as evangelicals. And in many ways, we need to reclaim that. Because in not reclaiming that, I think culture has taken over that ground in a lot of different ways and laid claim to our bodies and what we do with them. Well, so any conversation then about sex and identity then has to flow out of this fundamental understanding of the very beginning. We won't read this section because I'll trust that you're familiar with it, but you begin to see in Genesis 2, 18 through 25, you see the creation narrative as it relates to Eve. And I'll kind of paraphrase it for you like this. Adam, he's been tasked with naming all of the different animals. He's naming giraffes and zebras, etc. And he's looking for someone or something that he can fully image God with. Because God created him in his image, he's designed and made to be a community. He's designed to exist in a community. But there's nothing in the created order that allows him to do that. And so what does God do? God provides a helper for him. And when we think about the Genesis 2 narrative, we primarily, I think, mistakenly say, well, it's like a woman is a helper for man in that like he's got a lot of strengths and weaknesses, and so God makes him somebody who kind of complements those strengths and weaknesses. Like he doesn't like to, you know, do dishes or cook, and so God makes Eve, and she comes along, and she's really good at these things. You know, she's not really good at fixing things, and Adam is, and so they just make this great pair. That's not what the Genesis 2 narrative is talking about. The Genesis 2 narrative is saying, listen, man on his own cannot fully image God, so God makes a helper suitable for him. God makes someone in the created order suitable that he can fully image God with. That's a beautiful thing that then raises both the dignity of males and females together. That's why when Adam sees Eve there at the very beginning, do you see how all of that is block text? That's all prose. It's just prose, prose, prose. And when we get to that middle part, it's like the, the writer can't contain himself. And Adam breaks out into song. And then the Hebrew, that's actually how it's situated. That's poetry right there. And, and every guy here probably should take a little bit of a tip from Adam here. Because Adam sees Eve and he literally breaks out into song. And he says, at last, this is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. At last, he realizes this is someone who I can image God with. Todd Wilson writes, he says, uh, not, only are, so not only are we a relational being, Wilson goes on to say this, he says, put positively then, all sexual activity then ought to express and embody the one flesh union that we call marriage, for this is the God-given purpose of sex. Put negatively then, any form of sexual activity 
that fails to express or embody a one flesh union is out of step with the teaching of Scripture and outside the will of God. So within this context of a male-female marriage, God tells them they are to be fruitful and to multiply and to fill the earth, and therefore he locates and he positions sexual activity to happen where? To happen within the confines and within the context of a relationship, a marriage relationship. You're not supposed to do it on your own. You're not supposed to do it with somebody who is exactly like you, but that there is a complementarity between both a male and a female who come together, covenanted together by God, that is where sexual activity is to be expressed. Now, things start to go downhill in the fall, and we already know how this story begins to go. The narrative takes a sharp turn for the worse, and one of the very first things, and I think that we miss this sometimes when we teach this in church, that one of the most immediate and one of the most obvious effects of how sin affects mankind is how we view our bodies, how Adam and Eve viewed their bodies. So in Genesis 2, it's naked and unashamed, and the very first thing that we see with Adam and Eve in Genesis 3 is that they're what? They're naked and ashamed. The very first thing that they do is they're going off and hiding in the bushes, picking out some fig leaves, and, and sewing them together to make clothing, right? What heretofore had been something that they had not been embarrassed or awkward about now brings a level of discomfort and incongruence with their own bodies. Nancy Piercy writes, she says that the integration of body and soul was so complete that the body was a full, honest, genuine, undistorted expression of the person. But after the sin of our first parents, this body-person unity was torn apart. And one of the things that I think maybe can help us access this a little bit better, especially for those people who struggle with gender dysphoria, and as we talked about it last night, that might seem so difficult for us to understand because we said last night, maybe the vast majority of you in here have never felt uncomfortable with your gender. You've never woken up thinking, Maybe I'm a male or maybe I'm a female if you're that uh, particular gender. But here's a way that I think we can begin to access that experience is how many of you have ever been uncomfortable with your bodies? How many of you have ever been uncomfortable with how your bodies looked? How many of you have ever been uncomfortable with nakedness, right? We, we all can probably immediately access that. We all realize inherently that there are probably parts of our body that we realize are shameful or that we feel awkward about, all of which comes from the fall, right? That perfect unity that existed between body and soul is now ruptured because of our first parents' sin. Sam Albury writes this. He says, what's true of creation in general is true of our bodies too. They're a part of the physical order that's been subjected to this frustration. We see this frustration in a variety of ways. Some people face unremitting health issues. Others contend with a whole range of body image struggles. Still more experience body dysphoria, feeling as though they're trapped in the wrong kind of body. We talked about that last night. That's called body dysmorphic disorder. The fact is virtually no one has an entirely straightforward relationship with their own body. It's the way of life in this world. And while it is true, and while it is true that anyone can see this problem, Christians can uniquely account for it. Right? That's the beauty, again, of the biblical narrative. When people begin to talk about struggling with gender dysphoria, that should not surprise us. Christians actually should say, you know what, we actually understand why something like that might happen. We actually understand why there might be a sense of discomfort and incongruence with your embodied gender. We all have difficult and convoluted relationships with our bodies. And so while we might not be able to understand it completely, we can definitely account for it because of what Scripture has to say about the fall. From here on out, the stories of how the fall has affected our sexuality and our bodies, it is replete. I mean, these were just a few examples that I began to write down really just from the first few pages. You begin to realize from Genesis 3 onward that the way that sin works itself out in the world primarily has significant implications for how we do sex and how we do gender. That the stories in the Old Testament, many of them that we're familiar with, contain elements of sexual dysfunction contain stories of people being sexually abused and sexually hurt. And so that's why as we're moving to this third part of the story, not only creation, fall, but redemption, we are looking for someone and something that can make sense out of this. We're looking for someone or something that can put back and make right all of the dysfunction that has happened since Genesis 3. And that's where we get to this third part. And we'll talk about this redemption. We'll talk about this third part of the story in kind of two acts. 
Uh, we'll talk about the person of Jesus Christ, and we'll talk about the work of Jesus Christ. Uh, again, you're reading through your Bible, and you're reading story after story about people who we think, man, maybe they're it. Maybe they're really going to be the person, God's chosen one. You, you come across the pages of Scripture, and you come to someone like David, right? You think, man, maybe David's going to be the guy. He seems like a good guy, and he's anointed by God. And then what happens? There's adultery, right? And, and you realize every single person, every single person is a person, right? They, they continually fail us. And so when we get to the Gospels and we see Jesus Christ, we realize, man, there's something, there's something about him that is already incredibly different. When we see the first mention of Christ from the Gospel of John, one of the things that comes out to us immediately in John 1.14 is that Jesus comes to us fully embodied and fully gendered, right? And already then, we, we begin to take notice then of the goodness of both the body and gender, Right, that Christ comes to us as a fully engendered male. He comes to us in bodily form. John 1.14 says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glories of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Right, there's no Gnostic distaste here for the body. There's no ethereal suspension of His Spirit and just human flesh. Right, A lot of people around that time bought into this heresy called Gnosticism, which said, listen, the body is... Um, Ambrose of Milan called it the tattered garment of the soul. It's kind of just like this really weird tent that houses your spirit. So the body really is not that important. And Jesus actually pushes against that. We hear in John 1.14, no, no, Jesus actually comes to us with a body. He had arms, he had legs, he had a face that you could actually feel in touch. There's no distaste for the body or for gender uh, that we see in Jesus Christ. And throughout Jesus' life and ministry, we see that he lives a life that is free of all kinds of sexual brokenness and immorality, which we've become accustomed to in the story. Jesus is a person who never engages in any form of sexual immorality. And that's hard to imagine, right? I mean, think about it in your minds right now, what it would be like to live a life completely free of any kind of sexual temptation or sexual immorality. That's the life that Jesus Christ, as a fully embodied, engendered man, lived for 33 years. Well, why did he do that? The author of Hebrews tells us this. He says, therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and a faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Right? Christ comes in bodily form so that he can experience all the temptations of what it's like to live in a fallen world so that he could be our perfect mediator, so that he could be the person who can stand in the gap for us. Todd Wilson writes this. He says, no one was more fully human and more sexually contented than Jesus, yet Jesus never engaged in a single sexual act. Think about it. Jesus never enjoyed the pleasures of sex, an erotic touch, or a lingering kiss. And he never indulged sexual fantasy or lust of the kind that he roundly condemns. The Gospels portray a compelling and attractive person who engages seriously with people in his good company at a party, yet all the evidence is that he lived as a sexual celibate. Right? What Wilson is saying here is he's saying, listen, our culture says, listen, if you're not having sex, something is incredibly wrong with you. The pinnacle of what it means to be a human being is for you to live out your sexual identity. That is the absolute key to your happiness. And what we see in Christ is actually the exact opposite, that his sexuality is actually put into a framework in a context where he never acts out in a way that is sinful. He never acts out in a way that is not in keeping with how God designed and created sex to function. So the person of Christ offers us hope that Jesus comes to live life like one of us, body and soul and all of its particularity, but also the work that Jesus accomplished for us on our behalf. And that's what we want to talk about next. If you have your Bibles, turn over to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 16, or you can just follow up along with me on the screen. In Ezekiel 16, we get this kind of like this biographical story of the nation of Israel and it kind of narrates out their history and their story. And in the midst of that story, God kind of compares the nation of Israel, and he describes their broken, fallen, sinful condition with three different metaphors that you can find in verses 5, 8, and 9. He describes them as being an outcast. 
he describes them as being naked, and he describes them as being unclean. Naked, outcast, and unclean. Kind of three ways that the Old Testament will conceptualize or describe our sinful condition. And he says, listen, nobody wanted you. You were an outcast. Nobody in your family wanted you. They kind of just dropped you off in this field, and I took you in. And you were naked. You were just lying there. And, and, and Ezekiel is actually really graphic about how he describes it. But, but God says, listen, I picked you up out of the ground, and I actually covered you. I gave you clothing. And not only did I cover you and give you clothing, but I actually made you clean. I cleansed you. I cleaned you up. And so in all three of those different metaphors of being outcast, naked, and unclean, in the midst of that story, God describes what he did for the nation of Israel. Unfortunately, as the story goes on in Ezekiel 16, Ezekiel says, but listen, what's unfortunate is that you totally, forso- you, you totally left me. You totally went out and, and, and played the harlot. You were like a prostitute. Instead of staying faithful to me after all that I had done for you, you went off and did your own thing. But God said, that's not going to be the end of the story. That's not going to be the final word. And he says in Ezekiel 16, 59 through 63, he says, For thus says the Lord God, I will deal with you as you have done, you who have despised the oath in breaking the covenant. I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish for you an everlasting covenant. We go down to the last verse in 63. He says, I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, that you may remember and be confounded and never open your mouth again because of your shame when I atone for you and for all that you have done, declares the Lord. What God promises to the nation of Israel then is actually realized and actualized in the work of Jesus Christ. All of the amazing language that, that God promises to the nation of Israel about being restored and redeemed, about not being an outcast, not being unclean, and not being naked for, not being naked, all then gets realized in the work of Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ is someone who becomes outcast so that we can be brought into the family. Jesus is someone who is stripped naked for us so that we can be clothed with robes of righteousness. Jesus is someone who who becomes unclean so that you and I can become clean, so that the righteousness of God can be imputed to us. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, where he says, "'Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God?' And he goes on to list a bunch of different kinds of people. And at the very end, he says, such were some of you. Don't, don't get too haughty. Don't get too proud. This is, this is what you used to be like. Because you were washed and you were sanctified and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Sam Mulberry writes, he says, the only answer then to our experience of brokenness in our bodies and in our sexuality is found in the ultimate brokenness of Christ's body. He's the one who experienced the ultimate affliction. His was the body most reviled by other peoples. And the ultimate dysphoria ever experienced was he was when he who had no sin was made sin for us. Right? I mean, that talk about a sense of dysphoria and incongruence. Right? Albury is rightly recognizing there that's, that's Christ. He understands what that's like. Talk about being in the wrong flesh, yet he went through all of that for us. He experienced the ultimate brokenness so that we would never have to. So both the person of Christ brings us hope because Christ comes to us in bodily form. He suffers all temptation, especially sexual temptation, on your behalf. And not only is the person of work of Christ important to us, the person of Christ, but also the work of Jesus Christ on the cross because it's through the work of Jesus Christ that we are not naked, outcast, and unclean, but that we are brought into the family of God in something that has previously been very dirty and been very corrupt can now be made new because of Christ. That takes us then to the final ending, to consummation. We're told some glorious things about our future in heaven, especially as it relates to our bodies and our sexuality, and we can read about them in Revelation 21. I, was, I grew up in a Southern Baptist church-like uh, fellowship, and uh, when I grew up in church, I grew up in a small Baptist church as my whole life, and my teachers would use flannel graph to teach Sunday school lessons. And I think that my major, or at least the dominant way that I understood heaven was that Uh, Number one, heaven was a place where I was going to get my own mansion, so you definitely want to get saved so you can get a mansion. And uh, you were kind of just like floating. You were kind of like a quasi-angel human being. You were like on a cloud, most likely playing a harp, but you're kind of just like ethereally suspended like in the clouds, Uh, but everybody gets a mansion. That was kind of like the big selling point, mansion, baptism, new Bible. And so that's kind of what I grew up being taught. 
But when you go to Scripture and you actually read the very end, you realize that that actually probably is more culturally informed than biblically informed. That what we see in Scripture at the very end is probably people very much like us from every tribe, every tongue, every nation being gathered together, worshiping God for all of eternity. Not spread out in a bunch of different places, but gathered together in a new city, right? A new city where we're all worshiping God. And guess what? We're going to have redeemed bodies. You're not just going to be this floating angel floating ethereally from cloud to cloud. You'll have a redeemed body. And everybody in here, right, says amen. Like that is good news for all of us who have this deep discomfort with our bodies. Paul, the Apostle John, rather, writes in Revelation 21, he says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away, and he who is created on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And friends, that, that also has impact for our sexuality. That has impact for our bodies. That all that is broken and distorted and frustrated and not right and incongruent and disordered about your sexuality and about your identity as it relates to sexuality, all of that will be made new at the very end. Here's another way that the prophet Isaiah puts it. He says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. And friends, that is great and good news about our sexuality. It's great and glorious news for people who have been victims of sexual abuse and sexual assault. For some of you in here where we're talking about sexuality and our personal subjective experience of it, for many of you, you've actually been on the receiving end of sexuality gone bad. You've been the victim of sexual abuse. You've been the victim of sexual assault. You've been raped. And so the movement of Scripture is actually one that is encouraging for you because you realize that it's not as if those things didn't happen and and don't mean anything, but that we realize in the new heavens and the new earth that you will not remember those things anymore. Those things will not be coming to your mind anymore because God will be making all things new. That's glorious truth for everybody that struggles with disordered sexual desires, right? I would say maybe in a more in a more true way here, whereas with gender dysphoria, I would assume statistically speaking that there might be very few people in a group this size who would be experiencing gender dysphoria, there might be a higher probability that there might be people in here who struggle with same-sex attraction, who might be attracted to the same gender. And imagine a place where that sexual temptation to be attracted to someone of the same gender is no longer present that you have rightly formed and rightly ordered sexual desires. Can you imagine that? Even for everybody in here who struggles with heteronormative lust, imagine what it would be like to never struggle with sexual lust again. That's a glorious truth for all of us to begin to take in. That's why the understanding where you're going and understanding where you're headed is so important for Christians because it informs how we actually live in the present. The Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter 1.13, he says, set your hope fully on the grace that's to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That one of the ways that you actually live well now is by remembering what you're going to be then. And when we remember what we're going to be then, when God consummates all of creation into how it should be, that that actually gives us purpose and intentionality here in the present. We'll close with this. Andrew Walker says this, kind of summing up where we've been in this session He says, we live in a Genesis 3 world with a Genesis 1 blueprint on the trajectory to a Revelation 21 future, right? You live in a Genesis 3 world. Things don't go right. People are sexually disordered and sexually dysfunctional, but we are headed towards a, we are headed towards a trajectory where all of that will be made new where all of that will be redeemed. And the answer for that, the way that we get this Revelation 21 future, you guys, is through the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's because we serve a Savior who came to us as an embodied and gender male who lived a perfect life on our behalf. And because of that perfect life, because he died a sacrificial death in our place that his righteousness now gets imputed to us, that you and I don't have to do anything to get that, we don't have to do anything to merit that or achieve that, but that Jesus Christ's righteousness gets imputed to us 
because of who he is, not because of who you are. And that's the good news of the gospel. That's why all of us can be on that trajectory to a Revelation 21, 21 future if we are in Christ. So that kind of helps give us a much more stable framework and foundation and story for sexuality and gender in particular. So I want you to go all the way back to the Little Mermaid story, right? So what are we trying to do? I'm trying to tell you this is what a fork is for. This is what a fork is designed for. So that next time when you're interacting with somebody in culture or somebody who has a different view and they're taking the fork and they're brushing their hair with it, that you are better equipped and more informed and I would say more confident that this story actually provides a more compelling contrasting narrative for human sexuality and human thriving than what culture offers. Right? What culture offers basically says is sex is supposed to make you happy. But what they begin to realize is that ultimately there's something missing about that. You have, and you hear stories about people that are having sex, even great sex, but at the end of the day it does not bring the type of happiness that the guarantee is told to them. And so that's where I think in so many ways we should be what? We should be ready for an answer. We should be ready to offer an answer rather and be able to offer a more compelling story. And so that's what our goal was in this first session. When we come back in the next session after our break, we're going to move into talking specifically about sexual identity. And so much in the same way that we talked about gender identity last night, where we tried to understand some of the terms, why do people struggle in this way, how do people develop same-sex identity, uh, we'll really cover that and at the very end try to talk a little bit uh, about how do we interact with people who hold to a different view. So let's